Hello, listeners. Steve here. Do you know what I love more than a plant that will actually survive my neglect? It's a discount. And I'm not talking about any 5 or 10% markdown. I need at least 20% to turn my head. That's why I'm thrilled to tell you that you, our listeners, can get 30% discount on anything and everything at the Taunton Press store. And that includes the new Best of Fine Gardening archive. Yes, go to T-A-U-N-T-O-N-S-T-O-R-E.com, enter the promo code podcast, and get 30% off now. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who just love plants. <laughs> just not always the same ones. I'm Steve Aiken. I'm Danielle Sherry. We're both from Fine Gardening Magazine. And today is my topic, Steve, short plants. Well, why is it your short- topic? I probably grow more short plants than you do. I think you probably do, but I'm just, I, I'm feeling it because you're a tall person and I am a short person. So it's just, it's a topic that's very close to my heart so, and my so height. I have to grow like what? Like, you know, heavy set balding plants? Like, well, I don't understand <laughs> what. You said it, not me. Plant, plants with giant <laughs> foreheads. Like uh, that's, that's all I can grow. I, yes. I, I don't, I don't know if you, if you, if you recall, but there are a couple, a uh, couple issues ago, I actually wrote an article on short plants. You did, and it was all. all what was, it was? It had a really cheeky title. It was like, "I'll take, I'll take the short, or I'll take the tall, or what uh, was I'll, it?" I'll, I'll have the small, something like I'll that. I'll have the small. That's make, right. Make mine small, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> because my, my well, my thing is that uh, I have the mat. This long, you know, running the length of my property border um, needs to be short. Otherwise, I can't. Anybody coming out of the driveway can't see oncoming traffic. Because yeah. of the, the driveway slopes down and there's like a mound of, of earth, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so everything needs to be short. I need things that are that are less than uh, 14 inches, you know, maybe 16. Yeah. But anything taller than that, like I can't I can't grow there. Um, well, see, we should have talked about this beforehand because I figured everything under basically 23 inches counted as a short plant. Cause I think like two feet and below, you know, that 24 inch mark. So if it's 23 and three fourths inches, it still counts. Cause it, it's really hard to find short. I, I feel like it was hard to find short plants. I don't grow a ton of them. I've failed with a lot of them. So you admit and this is not your topic. This is my topic. It, it, it's it not is. your topic. <laughs> It is not my topic. And, you know, I grow so many, I, I you know, I have mes- mainly, mainly, bleh, mainly a shrub based design. And so, you know, my short plants are coming. Wh- what I need for my step down as my lower layer is generally like a three foot tall plant, you know, in that range. So, yeah, yeah it, it, it was tough for me, but I did go around this morning. I did, you know, kind of scope out some plants that have done well towards my front of the border. And, and uh, yeah, I've got some options, not great ones, but options. Yeah. I but, even threw but, in a shrub. <laughs> well, well, you, you, of course you did. Uh, you bring up an important point that, that small is relative. Mm-hmm. One of the first articles I ever did for fine gardening was on dwarf conifers. And, mm-hmm. you know, what's the height of this thing? Well, it's 20 to 25 feet. Yeah. Like, no, we need dwarf conifers. Like, well, that is because the species normally gets, you know, 75, 75. to 100 feet. So that's a dwarf yeah. version. Like, oh, okay. So everything's relative. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. With, with, I would I would say, how do you define short? Well, it depends on, you know, what you're talking about. I always kid my, my kids uh, that they're short uh, when they're both really tall because they're shorter than I am. So, you know, I always call them munchkin and shorty and stuff like that. Um so yeah, it's it's all it's all relative. It but, is. I mean, for for intents and purposes, did you stay under two feet for your for your plants? Uh, most likely, yes. I, I forget what my okay. final list is, um, but I had I had a shrub on there for a while that was um, in it was in the two to four feet range, but that's much smaller than the the, the most normal. Shrubs. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, in in that in that uh, in that genus, yeah, it was the shorter version of that. But that one got the axe. I, I think so. I would have to scroll down on my, on my notes to figure <laughs> on out. Your notes. 
Well, okay. So I'm going to start with the first thing that popped out at me as I walked around this morning. Well, actually, last night when you said, oh, we have a recording tomorrow of the podcast, don't we? And I said, oh, bleepity bleep bleep bleep. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and the first thing that popped out is, so I think I've talked about this before, but I have what's known as Hospital Hill in my part of the woods. <laughs> and uh, it's just this really, really sharp slope at the back of our property. It has terribly lean soil. I think it's basically the backfill from when they dug at the foundation for our house that they just piled up. It's scalding hot sun all day long and very little grows there um, except for a healthy crop of uh, basically weeds and uh, a little bit of sweet fern. But So I just chuck stuff up there. Anytime I come across something that says, oh, it's full sun, lean soil, thrives on neglect. I chuck it up there and see if it actually does take. Um, and years ago, I, I decided, oh, everyone was talking about Solidago. Solidago is great for that. Solidago is great for that. It grows by the side of the highway. So I had picked up a bunch of random Solidago. It was probably towards the end of the season and chucked them up there, um, pulled the tags, threw them in the truck tub, no idea what was what. And most of them did okay. And I think we've talked about this before when you were talking about um, maybe some fall bloomers and you mentioned a solid ego. I do have solid egos. Um, but the one that really stood out as I was walking around was this little short munchkin one that I have. Um, and it turns out as I went back to the truck tub and went through all of these <laughs> these labels, it was golden fleece goldenrod, which is a solid ego. Oh man, Cephaleta? Cephaleta? Come on, help me out here, Steve. Cepho. I'm, I'm, I'm never gonna get into it. I'm just gonna make it. I'm just, I'm just gonna make it. I'm just gonna make it worse. Okay, so it's actually it's so it, it's short pappus goldenrod, um, and it's a spe- it's a cultivar of short pappus goldenrod. It zones four to nine, and clearly you could tell that this was different from all the rest. You know, it was like the lineup, and this guy stood out because it's only about a foot tall, full grown, been up there for years, full grown, foot tall about a foot wide. Eventually, apparently it gets to be about a foot and a half by a foot and a half. And it's your typical solid ego that uh, it gets those around this time of year, mid to late fall, beautiful sprays of golden flowers that are all kind of bunched up around the stems. Um, right now, we've had a little bit of cool weather. So the foliage, which is just a nondescript greeny color, is turning a little bit maroon, which is kind of nice. Um, but the thing that stood out for me is, yeah, it's the, all of those are doing, all those solid egos are doing great on my, you know, hodgepodge hill. But this would make a really noteworthy garden plant because this little golden fleece is more compact, a little tighter. Um, the blooms are, you know, a little more well behaved. It's not splaying all over the place. We just had some rain. Everything else for the solid egos is splaying all over the place. This guy is pretty tight and compact. So I, I kind of like it because it, it obviously was not as weedy looking as the other ones. It's a North American native. Um, this one's native from Virginia to Illinois and then south down to Georgia, Mississippi. Um, um, so, so, it's, not, so it's, it's, it's not a native for you. It's not a native for me in Connecticut, but it's a North American native. So I get a, I get no, a half no. a point for that. You're part of the problem. I know I am in more ways than one. But yeah, so this is golden fleece, goldenrod, um, and it's a type of short pappus goldenrod, solidago spasolata. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, you as you were talking about it, uh, all I could think of is I want this plant, I want this plant, I want this plant. <laughs> because of my situation, you know, I, I need short plants and I need them to be tough. And solidagos are tough if it's on your hospital hill. Yeah. It's doing fine. Um, you know, the, the front of my property isn't something that gets close up attention. So no one's going to see the really kind of nondescript to unattractive stems of solidago, which are yes. there for, you know, uh, 80% of the season and the last 20% is when it looks great, you know? So, yeah. and that, that's all I need from it. Um, this, this sounds a uh, perfect plan for me. Golden fleece. Thank you for, for digging it up and, and bringing it over to my house. <laughs> I'll look to see self-seeded anywhere but yeah it, it's pretty funny you see tall solidago salt tall solidago tall solidago god only knows what those are this little short little munchkin and uh yeah it's cool 
It's cool. yeah, and it does it, it does it doesn't splay. So that's that's great. It doesn't too. splay. No splay here. <laughs> so so you walked around too, right? What did yeah, you see yeah. in your garden? Well, you know, I, I said, well, I got, I got a ton of short plants. Let me walk around, see see what what pops out at me. And you know, I'm walking and looking and walking and looking. And there's this one plant that that looks good, but it you know it always looks good. And I kind of you know, of course, that's looking good. Uh, which one is that again? Like, oh, it's germander. You know, tucurium tucurium uh, chamidris. Uh, zone, zones five, four to nine. I think it's Camadris, Camidris. Um, it's just it's just regular germander, which is a fairly common plant. Um, but the the thing about it is, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not the brightest guy in the world, and uh, I, I can't take a hint. You know, something needs to be uh, really hammered home before I before I notice it. And every time I look at this thing, I'm like, oh yeah, that looks great. Uh, and then I pass by because it's just germander. And I think I just bought it, you know, late season because I, I I had the need to buy a plant you know, and it looked good in the nursery. So I just bought it. Like I never, you know, but it, it always looks good. And it has these, um, you know, little oval uh, glossy leaves, like a deep green, you know, and little scalloped edges to them. Um, it, yeah. it, it just always looks good. It looks like a classy boxwood is what, what I say, but it's small. It's about one foot high, maybe a little, little bigger, about two feet wide. Um, and it's a sub shrub. Um, so the, 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 the stems will get woody, um, it, it'll have flowers in, in early summer there and they're in that, um, that pink, purple, magenta neighborhood that I could never mm-hmm. you know, actually name. Um, but it's, it's the type of plant that like, you know, even when I go to gardens and I see it, I'm like, Oh, what's that? And someone's like the, the germander. I'm like, yeah, that looks good. Like, Oh, and like, I feel dumb for asking. Cause I didn't know, I didn't recognize germander, but it's, it's one of those things. It's just, it's just. It, it always looks good, but it's not showy. Mm. You know, it's not in your face. And you kind of have to look at it. It's like, um, it's like in like team rom-coms where like, um, you know, the, the, the girl is always passed over until she takes off her glasses and all of a sudden she's beautiful and everyone realized like, Oh, she's been there the whole time. And yeah, she's always been feel like you never noticed. Well, yesterday, um, you know, walking around the Germander had her glasses off. Uh, so I finally mm. noticed her, you know, and fell in love with her. And I'm like, what? Why, why am I not growing more of this? This thing is always looking good. And it's it's supposedly evergreen. But I, but I think in November, like from November to March, I kind of stopped looking yeah. uh, at my plants because it's down. Why am I going to go down by the roadside, you know, in the snow and, you know, muck? Like, I, I have no idea. Uh, but it's supposed to be evergreen. Uh, yeah. I have given this zero care. It's a Mediterranean plant, likes it hot and dry. Um, and it's it's in my rock garden gravel area. Um, it has God knock on wood. It has been avoided by the voles. Um, I, I spoke to you yesterday about the Let's Argue About Plants curse, in which every time I recommend a plant, um, I go back it out of later and, and it's dead. Um, I don't want that to happen to this one. Um, but, but it's tucrium, and, and I actually made a list that next year. In 2021, I'm going to buy every germander I can find because there's a chartreuse one. There's a chartreuse one, Danielle. You know me and chartreuse. Like, oh, my God. Um, Well, so I I feel like a couple episodes ago, we had uh, Rebecca Sweet, who's a garden designer from California. And forgive me, I cannot. I think it was nooks and crannies plants. And out of her four plants, three of them were germanders. Um, so that just speaks to like, you know, their range that, that this is a, a tucrium is a really, really hard, heavy hitting genus that, I mean, you've got one of the premier garden designers out in California, just totally obsessed with the, that. And I think she actually talked about Walger Mander too, as being one that she really likes as well. Did you mention the zones on that, by the way? Four to nine, four to nine. Okay. So, That's so huge. That- Right, but I don't think it's a it's a it's a cold issue as a winter moisture issue yeah, with, with, with it coming back. And like I said, you know, Mediterranean, um, you know, it, it wants it. So California is perfect for it. You know, Oregon, yeah. you know, the, the West Coast. But but God, knock on wood, I haven't had the slightest bit of problems with this plant. Really, go, go, this is its fourth year. You know, as you and know, I as you're talking. I, I, I you know, as you're talking it. right now, the voles are like circling around it and they're like, Uga Chaka, Uga Chaka. Yeah, there, there's, there's like one vole with the headphones. It's like, he's talking about the Germander. Go after that one. It sounds great. <laughs> swarm, it, you know? swarm. Yeah. Uh, but, but like, it's not, it's not always the voles. They just die. I don't know what it is. Every time I recommend a plant, it then kicks the bucket. 
<laughs> and hopefully not Charmander it. because it's great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> on my list to buy every Charmander I can find next year. There's actually a native species um, that uh, I don't think it's as as popular or as um, good, you know, as 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 uh, this one. Uh, but if you're if you're into native plants and want the native one, there there is a native version of this. So yeah, wall Charmander. Everybody grow yeah. it. Except for the moles. All right. So, you know, I threw out a native plant. I'm going to throw out a non-native plant, but I feel like we cannot have a discussion about short plants without mentioning mini hostas, some mini hostas. There's a plethora of mini hostas. Oh, time out. Is there a tall hosta? There's so many talls. Yeah. Yeah. Like There's a bunch. Like most hostas are, are like, you know, under two feet. No, yes. there's many that are in the three foot range. Guacamole isn't great right, expectations, right, right. big, big blue. All right. So anywho, we all know from listening to the first 75 episodes of this podcast that I have very little shade. I have one little small shady corner other than, you know, the woodland areas around my house. So I have one little cultivated shade garden. And in that shade garden, which is somewhat protected by the deer, I've jammed in every love of hostas that I've ever had. So it makes total, totally no sense design-wise. There's a blue hosta. There's a green hosta. There's giant guacamole, which is chartreuse. And so years ago, I started dotting in um, European ginger, and it's made this really nice mat. And so dotted through that European ginger interplanted, I've put some mini hostas and one of them that kind of knits everything together that so it doesn't look as chaotic in this little shady corner is mini skirt hosta. Yes, mini skirt hosta. And it's absolutely adorable. That's what you have to say about these mini hostas because they're just Honey, I Shrunk the Kid versions of the big hostas. But this one's only six to eight inches tall, gets to be about a foot wide. I don't think mine's ever going to get that that wide. Uh, it's only about eight inches wide now, and it's several years old. But it's got everything, every color hosta in it. It's got blue. It's got white. It's got like a creamy yellow. It's got green. And it's all on this one variegated leaf that's a little bit wavy. Um tight little tuft of foliage, absolutely adorable. Um, looks great kind of popping up through that shiny dark green foliage of the European ginger. And I'm just in love with this little mini hosta. A lot of them have a tendency because they're so small that they just kind of fade into the background. But I think because of the ultra variegation, every single color on the leaf, this guy really stands out. Um, I just, I, I think it's adorable. I think that mini hostas are a great short plant for right along the edge of a garden, um, particularly a shade garden. Um, they need to be protected, obviously, from deer. If deer, that's prime rib for deer. So just like the big ones. But although, you know, it, the deer tend to go for the big ones instead of those little teeny weenies because I maybe it's too hard for them to like get down that low. It's a lot of effort to kind of go after those. So when I've noticed some nibbling maybe on the side of some of my other like Fire Island hostas, I've never noticed them nibble my mini hostas. So yeah, mini skirt and it, like all hostas, zones three to nine. Um, but this is one that I, I really do like. It's It's got it all basically. Um, I feel like I might have made it sound like it's garish because of all the colors in it but it's not it's very cute mini skirt mini skirt hooray <laughs> yeah, I, I i've always wondered if um mini hostas are less likely to be eaten by the deer just because they're they're harder to find you know they're easier yeah. to to um to, to blend in and things like that they might not notice them being down so low i don't have a ton of experience with, with mini hostas i planted uh, blue mouse ears one year leftovers yeah. from, from the plant sale um and voles um uh, so i did I, I didn't have time to fall in love with it I, I i didn't love it at first i kind of just planted it because i had it and i felt bad for it so i gave it a home to be eaten by the voles um but uh yeah it, it did sound a little garish you know but it, uh it, 
I trust that the photo on the website will do it justice and will. That's right. It will. It absolutely will. And yeah, if, if that brings up a good point. Everybody has, well, not everybody, but lots of people have written in and like, oh, I didn't know that you guys were on YouTube. So we, we are on YouTube. So we have this all recorded, this podcast, if you prefer to watch the podcast instead. Um, or, and or, you can go onto our website because we do put the plant lists um, from the episodes on our website along with photos, which we hate doing because it takes a really long time. <laughs> Both Steve and I complain about it, but it is all up there if you guys want to see what this mini hosta actually looks like. It's not garish, I promise. So uh, the, the the plant that I'm going to talk about, I should have paired with your um, Solidago, uh, but but I didn't pay attention to your list. Um, <laughs> it's it's like, uh, like Solidago. It's a North American native uh, like Solidago, it is um, a, a late season bloomer, you know, late okay. summer into fall. Like Solidago, it is yellow. Uh, mm. And this I is know this which is one you're gonna say. yeah, it, it's a it's a smaller uh, black eyed Susan. Uh, it's called mm. Little Gold Star, um, uh, Rebecca Fulgida variety Sullivantii. And there's some question as to whether it's that variety or not. You know, if if you like to geek out on whether it's Fulgida or the variety Salivantii, um, mm -hmm. go ahead, um, have fun with that. Uh, but it, it reputable sources say that it is the the variety Salivantii. Uh, the cultivar is definitely Little Gold Star, and it definitely stays under two feet, um, barely getting over a foot. Uh, tall, maybe about two feet wide. And so think of think of um, the the basic black eyed Susan, but smaller. Um, I know I think it was an episode or two ago. I, I recommended uh, American Gold Rush, um, yeah. and this this one this one is just as good. Um, but uh, I recommended it because I've already recommended American Gold Rush, and I needed this one. But we planted this one in the fine gardening test garden, and uh, when, when I went back there, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I just, I, I fell in love with this thing and I had to take, I had to take a picture of it. It just, it just, uh, it's a little fuzzy. Oh, okay. Daniel, don't, don't give me a hard time. It's a little, it's a little soft, but it's, it's the actual blend and the actual, um, uh, fine gardening test garden that people will see online. Um, and it's just, it's like, it's like a puppy, you know, like it's cuter because it's smaller, you know? And you, 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 you just, you just want to talk, you know, nonsense and funny voices to it. You know, like, oh, who's the good bloomer? Who's the good? It's you, isn't it? It's you, isn't it? Little gold star. You, you little, and you want to ruffle, you know, ruffle its, its, um, its, its, its flowers on the top. Uh, it's supposedly more floriferous than the regular, you know, gold sturm, black eyed mm. Susan, like more branches and more flowers on those branches. I don't count. So I'm just passing along what, what other people have said. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I've had no problem with diseases on it, although I haven't grown it for very, for very long. Um, you know, it can take a dry spot, you know, if you have a yeah. spot that, that, uh, that doesn't get a lot of uh, watering, but just a, a great, uh, performer, cute little smaller version. If you don't want the bulky kind of running rampant, uh, go everywhere, black spot riddled black eyed Susan, try a little gold star zones four to 10. Yeah. It looked, um, it, it actually looked, Little Gold Star actually looked more compact than American Gold Rush in the photo. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen American Gold Rush in person, only in photos, but it, it Little Gold Star looked so, like so much more compact than, than American Gold Rush. Yeah. I, I would need more time with them to, to mm. see if that, that, because, um, it's, it's a new plant you know, in th that we've been growing. And, um, I think it was just, I, I think I planted three of them. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, I, I would say it, it, if it's, it's not certainly not less, you know, compact, it's either is mm -hmm. as equal or more compact. Um, mm -hmm. but, but a great plant too. Uh, yeah. and it's, you know, it, and we're, we're, we're actually recording this in, in what, uh, October. So, you know, all I can think about are, you know, black eyed Susans and asters and things like that. So And Solidago. Uh, and Solidago. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned blue mouse ears as a cast off from the plant sale that you planted years ago, that mini hosta. And the next plant I'm gonna recommend, you're gonna give me a hard time for because they're all short. Ooh, but okay. it's <laughs> it's an epimedium that was a cast off from the plant sale. And it's called Sandy Claws. Not Santa Claus, which I think is such a cute 
a spin on that name. We had that at the plant sale. <laughs> we did, we did, and and yeah. there, it was. There were two different varieties of epimedium that were kind of left over. I think that there was one that was spine tingler and one that was sandy claws. So I just want to put a little star that it could be either one because they look so similar, but I'm, I'm quite sure upon researching my plant tags from the trug tub that this one is sandy claws and it's epimedium wushanese sandy claws. It's, it's zones six to eight wushanese. Wushanensi? Wushanensi! Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Opa! Yes, that is what it is. Exactly. Um, so, yes, epimedium wushanensi, zone six to eight. All epimediums are short. This one is 12 to 18 inches tall and wide. That's about what it is now. This is about three, maybe four years in my garden now. However, not what you're thinking of as a typical epimedium leaf. It's elongated. It almost looks like a sword shape. Um, and along the edges of this sword is these crazy spines, for kind of a yellowish tan color. They really stand out against the dark green leaves. This one emerges too. The leaves emerge a dark maroon color. Absolutely beautiful. Eventually they fade to green puts on those uh, late winter, early spring flowers that are kind of orchid-like, little mini orchids that are on these wiry stems. They come out in kind of a, a flourish, if you will. There's several of them that are bunched on the stems, and they just kind of dangle there like little stars. But you know, it's it's really all about the foliage, those really, really spiny edged leaves that are so cool. Um, and epimediums rock, man. I mean, they take dry shade like no other plant I've ever had before. Um, I think I've mentioned this before that I've had a couple of other epimediums that I have literally planted at the base of mature hemlock trees um, on my property and they're thriving. They look great. So talk about root competition, moisture competition, these guys do great. Um, so this spine tingler is just an awesome, awesome epimedium. Um, a lot of them can kind of get lost in the fray. I feel like when an epimedium um, kind of, you know, isn't in bloom and doesn't have that new growth color, it kind of fades into the background a bit, becomes more of a ground cover, if you will. But this spine tingler, because of those spikes all over it, it, it really, uh, it really stands out. Um, also, deer resistant covered in spines. Um, deer don't tend, I've had a little munching on some other epimediums before, nothing, you know, little browsing here and there, but not nothing significant. But this one has been completely left alone because I feel like just the sheer sight of it scares the pants off the deer. So yeah. Uh, so that's Sandy Claus epimedium, not to be confused with Santa Claus. <laughs> so I just have, um, two things to say about, uh, epimediums. Uh, if you ever see one in a nursery, you should buy it. Yes. If, if you have any sense, you should just buy it. You're, you're going to thank yourself. It might not be the showiest thing at the time, but you're, you're going to thank yourself later. Number two, epimedium cultivars seem to have the best names. They really do. There's, there's space invaders. There's sandy claws. They, there's all spine sorts of uh, spine tingler. They're just all great mm -hmm. names there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and and for that reason, we should support that, you know, with our dollars. And that's another reason why you should buy um, epimediums whenever you buy them because they have cool right. cultivar names. Yes, this is so true. This is so true. I think uh, somebody who does a lot of the development on those, or at least uh, did this one and Spine Tingler, was Daryl Probst, I think. Um, yep. Popular plant po propagator, plant genius. So we'll, we'll give him the props for those great plant names. Cool. So um, I think all epimediums are short, so uh, I'll give you a pass on that one. Um <laughs> But the uh, because the the plant I'm going to talk about I probably need to pass on too because I probably talked about it before I think I asked you this mm -hmm. uh, Georgia Pancake uh, Blue Star or Georgia mm -hmm. Pancake Amsonia is how I how I know it uh, it's Amsonia ciliata variety filifolia filif 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 uh, <laughs> Georgia Pancake is the uh, is the cultivar name uh, zones five to nine um, and this is um, this is a plant with no height. It has no height. You you can't grow shorter than, than this plant. Um, 
I, you know, looking online, I, I saw some of the six inches. I'm like, okay, maybe eventually. Uh, but it basically lies flat on the ground. It has these stems that lie flat on the ground at virtually uh, no height. It's going to spread maybe like a foot or two. Um, and if you know Amsonia hubrichtii, mm. um, you, you get these soft, fluffy, um, you know, soft green um, needle-like foliage. Um, just imagine that just lying all over the ground. And that's what Georgia pancake is. It is soft and fluffy. Um, and the stems just, they don't know which way to go. You know, they start mm-hmm. off going, going this way, then they bend back and they go around. And it, the, the plant always looks like it just woke up. You know, like it's just, it's just going all over. The, it's it's having, you know, it's, a, it's got bed head. Um, yeah, but, but, uh, yeah, I wasn't making a comment on that. Um, but, it, but, but, but imagine all that in a good way. So it's really mm-hmm. like this, this, this cool tangle of of soft green uh foliage it's just a it's a what it's a wonderful looking ground cover it's not dense enough to choke out weeds or anything like that um mm-hmm. but it does take up space um a full sun uh, i i haven't planted and you 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 toured my garden mm-hmm. i haven't planted all over the place as yeah. uh, maybe a kind of an experiment um i have dry soil pretty much everywhere um, but the, the place where this is doing the best is in the fullest sun and in the driest soil. Um, th- that's where those ones are doing the best. And they're just kind of, they quietly go crazy because they, they come back late. You know, it's like every, every spring, everybody else is coming back and I'm looking at the old Georgia pancakes. I'm like, Oh, that was it for you. We had a good run, buddy. You know? And then I go back a couple of weeks and they're starting, Oh, you did come back. And then I go, you know, late July, August, you know, and they, they've just spread out with their, you know, their little tentacles going everywhere. Um, it, it flowers with, with these pale blue star-like flowers, uh, but they're on these stems that kind of stick up. Because everything is lax and wandering, and they get these little stems that kind of half stick up, half don't, it looks really goofy. So it looks like bedhead with cow licks, you know, mm. uh, but but it, it, in a cute way. Because, like, you know, we all like the, the little boy with the messy hair and the cow lick. And like, oh, you cute mm-hmm. little boy. You, you, again, you ruffle his, ruffle his hair. Um, yeah, it's, it's got that kind of effect uh, to it. Um, I've killed a few, and I, I don't know how. Um, but the, one, the ones in shade are surviving but not thriving. And like mm-hmm. I said, the ones in, uh, in full sun and dry are doing really well. You know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's just it makes a nice, really cool-looking mat of foliage in between which you will have to pull out weeds, but that's, that's okay. So my question to you is, cause when I did tour your garden, I just assumed that there was some self sowing going on where there was, you know, little tuffets of the Georgia pancake <laughs> all over, but was it not self sowing? And it, no, that was just no. how you planted it? <laughs> no, it was, it was a plant that I was looking for at nurseries uh, for a couple of years. And I found it at, at one place and they had three of them. And I planted okay. all three of them and um, two of them died and I had one. I'm like, man, I need more of this. And I actually went to like the local, like regular nursery, like late in the season one year. And they had like eight of them. And I'm like, oh my God, not only do I want all eight, I don't want anybody else buying this because somebody else is going <laughs> to buy it. Somebody else is going to buy it and they're not going to value it the way that I will. You know, they're not gonna, they're just going to think it's just some other plant. They're not going to know. I, I need to buy these plants. And so I bought like eight or however many of them. Like, a, you know, I came, I came back with, with all of them. I bought all of them. I literally bought all of them at the nursery hat. Okay. That and explains so that's, it. That's why they are everywhere. Um, that explains yeah, I, it. I, no, I, well, I, 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 yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a knock by any means because, you know, like Am, Am Sonia Hubrichtii will self sow and you'll get, you oh, yeah. know, some little seedlings here, there and everywhere. And I just thought, yeah. oh, Georgia Pancake must do that as well. But no, no, it does not. Okay. All right. Well, uh, at, least, at least not yet. Um, okay. It, it took my Hubrichtii a couple of years to do that. Um, yeah. I've never, I've never really seen it set seed. Um, okay. All yeah. right. So yeah. this will be interesting. Well, when it yeah. does, you know who will gladly take a few Georgia pancakes off your hands. Uh, no, I will. I, I, you won't value it the way that I will. You put it on Hospital Hill or something like that. And it won't, uh, they need to go to a good home. You know, I need, I need to, I need to do a background check before I give these seedlings to anybody. Oh, all right. Okay. And you will not pass. <laughs> all right. My last plant you are going to give me flack for because. Yes. 
You always do, no matter what. And it's a shrub and it's a juniper. I'm waiting for the reaction. <laughs> well, I, well, I think, I think, I think junipers get uh, some unwarranted hate. They get a lot of unwarranted hate for, the, for, their, for, their, for their overuse. Um, and you Amen. just kind of see like the bad ones. And the fact that if you go near them, they kind of bite you and leave, they leave me with like little bumps on my arm. And I don't like that. Exactly. But there are a lot of great ones out there. Again, and the reason, but, but, but none of them, well, most of them are short. Like, I don't know where, <laughs> why yes. are you picking? You're picking. <laughs> because I had slim pickings, okay? And shorter is better is fine, all right? It's short. It applies. It is applicable. Um, wait, wait, wait. So, yeah. is, is, is it going to be Dobbs Frosted? No, 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 because that doesn't stay short. That one gets okay. actually pretty big. Um, so that's that's usually I, I love that juniper so much. But the reason that junipers are so overused and they bite you are, is the reason why they're so awesome in so many circumstances. They take drought. They take lean soil. They take full sun. They take neglect. They're spiky. Deer don't eat them. <clears throat> I have a feeling that their roots must taste terrible because the voles have left all of my junipers alone. Whole hog. They, they hide leaves and garbage and, you know, plastic bags. <laughs> you know, yeah, they're, they're wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they take lean, lean, lean soil. I mean, you have a really crappy spot out, you know, in the back 40 of your, pro put it, put a juniper. They're great. Um, so yes, you know, blue rug juniper, uh, several other junipers I can name overused way way overused and truth be told this is a blue juniper but this is something that i'm fairly certain this variety called burly blue b-u-r-l-y burly blue trademarked um it's actually mon oliver is its cultivar name i think this was a sample plant many years ago that was sent to the fine gardening offices and I was just getting started on my new garden. I had really crappy soil and I thought nobody else has taken these junipers. <laughs> I'll take them. Uh, chucked them in, gave them no care, gave them nothing whatsoever. And it turns out that this burly blue is actually pretty cool. It's uh, texture and foliage appearance is almost more canisiparous like. It looks a little bit more scaly and kind of tasseled needles almost. Um, it is a low growing guy for sure. Only two feet tall. I got to be honest, mine is maybe eight inches at this point. So this is super slow growing. Um, it is zones three to eight, so wide breadth of this guy, and a beautiful bluey green color to it. And right now, because we've had a little bit of cool weather, every year it gets this purplish sort of cast to it, just ever so slight. And the reason I like that is because I grow it in tandem with a juga. Um, so I've got those dark kind of maroony colored leaves that are all scalloped and beautiful mingling in with that bluish juniper. Um, and the whole thing just kind of makes a really nice scene. I've got some silver foliage plants thrown in there too. I'll put a, I'll put a photo online. Um, but yeah, this is just a really, really cool juniper. Um, I really love it. It's more, I find it to be more compact than a lot of other ground cover type junipers. Um, there isn't all of those naked spots in that really, really woody area that you sometimes get with junipers. But it's it's a simple plant. It's doing really, really well. Um, it's required zero care on my part. And it's just rocking. And I love the combination of it with the ajuga right up front in my garden. Shorter is better in that in that instance. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I would say, like, you know, it, junipers are your plant if you're going for the parking lot look. If you want, <laughs> if you want your garden to look like the parking lot of the doctor's office um, or the grocery store, like, yeah, go juniper. I, th I think that's the great, the great way to go. Hey, um, no, that's insulting. You, it it you is, it is picture. insulting. It's, 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 a, it's, un you... it's unfair. It's like hmm. it's like saying that any um, ornamental grass is trash because crabgrass is ugly. <laughs> and grows everywhere. Like it's, it's, it's unfair. There are a lot of wonderful juniper uh, uh, options out there. And I wish yeah. I had some, but I'm afraid to go near them because they bite. Uh, some of them bite. Not, not all of them yeah. bite. 
And um, I, I, I dread the thought of lifting up the foliage and getting at the, you know, having to rake out the leaves because, you know, leaves get everywhere. Um, and it, it, I'm, re- I'm reminded of the time that you and I, we actually recorded a podcast up at Mass Hort um, mm-hmm. a, a while back. And we sat there while we were recording, watching the voles run back and forth across the grass. They were hiding underneath the junipers. Like they, 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 they were like a, a wonderful fort. Um uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh! Maybe that's where my my voles have their lair. Could it's be. in the burly. It's in the burly blue juniper. Yeah, it's like it's now you like know a, I'm going to go out there with a blowtorch and blow yeah. the whole corner of the garden. Up. A, a juniper is to voles the way like a rocky abandoned island in the middle of the ocean is to evil scientists. <laughs> like that's where they make their lair. Yeah. I, uh, all right, I'll report back on that. But for all intents and purposes, if there isn't a vole lair in that burly blue juniper, burly blue juniper is an awesome plant. <laughs> So my awesome plant is one that I had low expectations for. Um, again, I think this was a, um, a, a, a leftover from, from the, the plant sale, which I think we need to do again just so that I can get more plants by accident. You know, like I found so many great plants that like I didn't know I wanted and I just brought them home and, and planted them. Uh, but I planted one, you know, it's a one little lonely guy and I had low expectations for it. Uh, because it is a, it's a, it's a shade plant from, from Asia, which normally need like, like super moist soil, you know, otherwise they, they up and quit. Um, and this is, this is Quicksilver Chinese wild ginger. A serum Pretty. splendens Quicksilver, uh, zone six to nine. Um, so I'm, I, I really had low hopes for it and I planted it's probably in a four inch pot and it's maybe now about eight inches wide, supposedly should spread to about a foot. Uh, six to eight inches tall um, and partial to full shade, moist soil. It does need moist soil. Um, but if you look at this plant, it's it's deep green, like these elongated heart shaped leaves, but like with like a deep green with like a silver modeling all over it. Uh, mm-hmm. And they look super cool in the shade. And, uh, they're just amazing. Um, this has survived for me without supplemental watering for for three years two or two or three years and this year when we've had a drought um it it has it's been the first thing to wilt Mm -hmm. um but it it doesn't quit you know it's not like that's it i'm done you know like like when wilting it's like um it it does I, i imagine it having a british accent you know and it's like, oh, sorry, I sorry, I, just, I can't seem, I can't seem to stand up uh, a- a- anymore. So just a spot of water, if you could, please. Um, you know, and then, and then I water it a little bit, like that's how I know when it's time to water. Hmm. Um, and then I will water, and it'll stand back up. Um, but uh, it's, it, it wilts, but it doesn't quit, and it'll come back hmm. for you. And, and we are in a severe drought this year, and it's the first time yeah. I've had an issue with it. Um, but gorgeous, gorgeous foliage. I can't. I'm not exactly sure how the, the, the cultivar is different from the species. I think it's a tighter habit um, and, and it's a, maybe it's a little smaller, um, but I, I can't, I can't, the, uh, the straight species looks the same as this. So if you're going for the looks and you can't well, just, find the, the cultivar. <clears throat> just wait, you know, they're going to do genetic testing on it. Like they're doing on all the plants and find out that the cultivar and the straight species are exactly the same plant. So just, just hold off. <laughs> Then we'll yeah. have to change it. We'll have to change they're, uh, everything. They're, 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 not only are they the same plant, but they're also uh, in the genus Salvia. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the, the other thing about this plant is that it's it's never without a slug hole. There's mm. always at least at least one leaf has a slug hole in it. They're never decimated. They're never destroyed, but they're also never perfect. There's always a slug hole in it, but they mm. still look good because that hole you can see, th- you see through to other, you know, foliage. Silver it's, foliage, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's really cool. It's It's been tougher than I thought it would be. Um, and, and I love the way that it bounces back, you know. There are some plants that, you know, like hydrangeas that mm-hmm. wilt. Like, oh, the sun is too hot on me. Oh, geez, I'm going to wilt until the sun goes away, you know. Uh, this isn't like that. Um, and, and when it does wilt, you know, like I said, it comes right, comes right back. You know, that's awesome. the, the, other, the other plants that wilt, they're done. There's not coming back. That's the end. That's the last. Yeah. They didn't give you any warning. It's up and wilted, you know? Yeah. Uh, like that's not the wilted and died in the same thing. That's that's not cool. This one gives you a little warning. Gotta need some water, sir. You know, please, please, if you could with the hose, you know. 
And so I give, give it a little watering, it stands right back up, like, you know, and, and everything's fine. Uh, but very cool um, shade plant, tougher than I thought. And uh, I really think this is going to look great with some grasses. I want to plant some 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 carex around it, like some sedges, um, your favorite plant. Um, and I think it's going to look really good. Yeah. <laughs> of course you're going to. I I mean, I could. I saw that coming from a mile away as soon as you said, I'm going to plant. And I was just like, he's going to say carex. He is going to say carex. Hold it's, on, it's, folks. It's he's going to say carex. <laughs> It's better than a juniper. <laughs> and now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter with his thoughts on short plants, whatever they may be. <laughs> I would like to offer a design suggestion, if I may. If you think of short plants as front-of-the-border plants, you're limiting yourself. Weave these lower-growing options back into a bed and between taller plants, and you will find that your garden feels fuller, has more depth. And while we're on this topic, which uh, admittedly I brought up, feel free to bring taller plants to the front to get the same effect. But choose those that either have interesting stems or foliage all the way to the ground. No one likes to look at gangly stems. Take these steps and you'll be providing interest on multiple planes and multiple depths, which makes your garden so much more fascinating. And you get to toss around phrases like multiple planes and multiple depths. It's all right if you don't know exactly what that means. It's like Steve's approach to everything. If you can't be smart, at least sound smart. Oh, that Peter. He's one of a kind. <laughs> everything really does sound better with a British accent. <laughs> Except when I do it. Yeah, that, very true. Very true. Um, I'm interested to see who we've got on expert testimony. So let's see who's up next. Hi, I'm Susan Morrison, and I'm a landscape designer in Northern California, as well as the author of The Less Is More Garden, Big Ideas for Designing Your Small Yard. We have a lot of small gardens in my part of the country, so small plants are always in big demand here. The first plant I have to share with you is Dianella Baby's Bliss, which goes by the common name of Flax Lily. Like a lot of designers, I tend to be obsessed with foliage color and texture, and I really like plants that look good year round. Baby's Bliss is one of the smallest Dianellas that's available. It's going to grow about a foot wide, maybe get to a foot and a half. The leaves are sword shaped and they look pretty good year round with only minimal maintenance. You might have to occasionally clean out a clump of dead leaves. The color is a really attractive blue green. And in cooler climates, the plant will do fine in full sun, but in hotter inland gardens like mine, it will tend to develop a bluer color and be less likely to burn if you can give it some afternoon shade. It's hardy in USDA zone 7 to 11, and once it's established, it does fine on a low to moderate water watering schedule, although it's also fine with more. It does get smallish violet-colored flowers followed by small seed pods, but they're fairly delicate and they don't really read very strongly from a distance. So I would say choose this plant because you like the foliage. Dianella is great because it offers really amazing contrast to hot colors. In fact, it looks really pretty in an orange pot. If you are going to plant it in the ground, one of my favorite companion plants is Nicotiana alata lime green or lime green flowering tobacco plant because that blue foliage really contrasts beautifully with the chartreuse flowers. And the scale of the two plants work together because the Nicotiana is gonna get about 30 inches around. Now I am sticking to the assignment that I got from Fine Gardening and I'm focusing on plants that stay less than 16 inches. But if you do have more space, I have found that Dianella Clarity Blue holds its color a little better and it tends to adapt more quickly to low water situations than other Dianellas. But it can get two feet across. So make sure um, you have enough space if you'd like to try Clarity Blue instead. Another small plant that I'm fond of is GM Koi, which is spelled K-O-I. If you, like me, are a fan of GMs, then you know that for the most part, they're smallish plants, but they're not tiny. Most cultivars are gonna form a clump that's gonna be two and a half to three feet across. And that's one of the things that makes koi so nice because if you wanna get that really intense pop of color, but you have a smallish spot, this can be a good option for you. In fact, it has the same vivid orange flowers that you see on GM Totally Tangerine, 
But this plant is only going to get about a foot tall, and that includes the height of the flowers, not just the leaf clump, and get a spread of about 15 inches. The flowers themselves are typically an inch and a half to two inches across, which actually is a pretty good size for such a small plant. In my garden, it blooms in spring, and it's happiest if it gets a little bit of shade. But if you live on the coast, or if you live anywhere where summers tend to be cooler or cloudier, then full sun is going to be a better option, and you probably will get some repeat bloom through the summer. I have found that it's not as drought adapted as full-size GM, so definitely plant it somewhere where it can get fairly regular water. It does go winter deciduous, but it pops back up in spring, as long as you live in USDA zones 8 through 11. And I also have to say, this one is a little hard to find in, uh, in a retail nursery. So if it's something that you're interested in trying out, you're probably going to have better luck if you search on an online nursery. A small plant that makes up one of the staples in my plant palette is Oregonum Kent Beauty, which goes by the common name Kent Beauty Oregano. Now this is an ornamental oregano, so you're not gonna be able to cook with it, but it does actually have a, a mild fragrance to it. What makes it so stunning is actually the color of the bracts. And if you're not familiar with this term, there are some plants, and bougainvillea actually comes to mind as one of the best known tropical plants that does this, but there are some plants that have very colorful specialized leaves surrounding the actual flowers. And the bracts can be so colorful that they are mistaken for the flowers. For Kent Beauty, what this does is it creates a wave of changing color on each stem. And the stems go from green to a soft pink to chartreuse. Each plant is gonna get about a foot around and the growth pattern actually gives it a really lovely draping effect. So you wanna use it in an area where that effect is going to be an advantage. For me, I usually put it next to pathways where it can spill over and soften the edges. It also makes a really good spiller plant in a container as it mounds over the side, but it doesn't spill all the way down to the ground, so you don't completely obscure the look of the container. Really, virtually anyone can grow this plant. It is not very particular about soil or irrigation. Uh, it does like good drainage, and it will survive the cold all the way down to USDA zone four. It's winter deciduous, so it does disappear, but to me, it's still worth it because it's one of the plants that I most look forward to seeing again once spring rolls around. Gosh darn it, every time we listen to these expert testimonies, I think, oh man, there's more money out of my pocket because I want to have all those plants. I need them in my oh, life. Exactly. That's what the podcast is supposed to do, make you want more plants. <laughs> I guess that's true. And that's why we have this podcast. All right, I don't feel bad anymore. And our new tagline will be the podcast for people who want more plants. Uh, yeah, I don't think that works. I don't think that works. Tune in next time to see if we change our tagline. If you've been waiting to become a subscriber of Fine Gardening Magazine, now is the time. Our holiday sales are right around the corner, so check our website frequently and follow us on social media to stay informed on upcoming deals. Go to finegardening.com to see our offers today. See our offers today. See our offers today.